Is there a link between masturbation and prostate cancer? Because I've, I've heard a lot of different things about it. Um, some people think that over masturbation is causing prostate cancer and some people say the opposite. Yeah, so there's actually a really good study um, that was done looking at ejaculation frequency and prostate cancer. And it was a very well done study. They tried to control for a lot of other factors. And so what they found was that men who ejaculated 21 times or more a month were less likely to develop prostate cancer. This is just a statistical number. It is not a number that sort of um, means anything in terms of, but we're seeing that like, okay, so more masturbation may help. Why is that, right? So there may there's a prostate stagnation hypothesis that the fluids that, you know, some of your ejaculate fluids come from the prostate. And so when you're ejaculating frequently, you're more often re getting rid of that fluid and sort of re replenishing it or cleaning the pipes, so to say. So that may be beneficial in terms of preventing prostate cancer. Now, do you have to masturbate or ejaculate or have sex 21 times a month? Um, no, but you know, there could be a benefit. Yes. And so, uh, having a healthy, and it may be that those people who had sex more often or ejaculated more often were just healthier in other ways, right? They were able to have sex more often or masturbate more often because they were, uh, su you know, sufficiently healthy to do so. And so, the, I mean, while they tried to control for those things, there's always sort of uncontrollable variables that come into those sort of studies. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is, is there another like glaringly obvious factor that those people had more relationships, therefore their mental health was better, therefore yeah. X, Y, and Z? I think or? they tried to control for comorbidity but again, they're, 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 I don't think they controlled for, I mean, they controlled for marriage, I believe. Um, but I'm not sure that they controlled for like in a relationship versus not and how healthy that relationship is. That certainly wasn't assessed. One of the big questions that people often ask me when I'm speaking to someone that has expertise on sexual health is about masturbation and whether it decreases your testosterone levels. So it does not. There is one study and it was done in 10 men who abstained from masturbating for 21 days. And these are young, healthy men, right? And so this is where I think everyone gets their data from is this one study. And so they took their testosterone before, they took their testosterone after. At, and what they found was that there was an increase by about 50, 50 nanograms per deciliter, 0.5, um, which is 50 nanograms per deciliter, which is not a huge amount um, at 21 days. But we know that testosterone changes all the time. And two, there's a lot of anticipatory cues when you've been waiting to masturbate for 21 days, like your brain is, is really excited. There's all these like, okay, I'm finally going to get to release. And that in and of itself can increase testosterone. So generally speaking, there's no empiric evidence that is convincing high quality level evidence that masturbating or abstaining from masturbation will increase testosterone. And so there, you know, people do report other benefits. And so I tell people, if you're getting other benefits from abstaining, by all means, go ahead, but don't do it for, don't like white knuckle it to gain some theoretical increase in testosterone that one was not even that large. And two is probably not going to be proven in a larger sample. What about the opposite then? Is too much masturbation going to have an adverse effect on us for men and women? Yeah. So I think it, you know, what I tell people is masturbation is generally safe as long as you are not masturbating to the point where you are now choosing to masturbate over doing anything else. So you're choosing to masturbate rather than have sex with your partner. You're choosing to masturbate over going to work or you're, I'm going to be a little late to work because I want to finish masturbating. Or you literally can't sleep without masturbating every day. Like those sorts of things, you become reliant on this particular activity for the enjoyment that it provides. Um, that's when it becomes a problem. But if you're using it in terms of like, I'm masturbating to get orgasm and the benefits of orgasm that I do achieve from that, because maybe my partner doesn't want to have sex, or maybe I have more of a sex drive than my partner, or I don't have a partner. Like, let's be realistic. Like if you don't have a partner, you're going to have to, if you want to orgasm, you're probably going to have to masturbate. And so I think the problem also comes in is when people only masturbate the same way every time they only watch a certain type of erotic film or they do the same thing every time and their body habituates to that. And then they have a difficult time climaxing with a partner because they can't replicate what they're doing, whether what they're watching or how they're doing it with a partner. Are we teaching ourselves something there? 
Are we teaching ourselves how we're aroused and how we orgasm? Yeah. Your brain is very powerful, right? So when you're doing the same thing every time, your body's like, oh, this is what turns me on. This is what makes me orgasm. And then when you're with your partner, you're like, oh, I'm not getting that same kind of stimulation. And so it doesn't happen to a lot of people, but I would say certainly I see people where this does happen. And so, um, you know, you have to sort of take a break and, and sort of reevaluate and try different things and get your body to habituate to different things, which takes a little bit of work. Um, but sort of keeping it varied can be helpful. Another big myth, masturbation will make me go blind. Yeah, no, there's literally, I don't know where that came from. There's like hairy palms, blindness. Like, I don't know where, I, I think this is all sort of like from religious rhetoric that says, you know, you should not masturbate. Um, and, and it, you know, where that came from, you know, is a whole other story, I think. What do you think of this idea of no nut November? Yeah. So I think it's, I, I'm not a fan. The reason being is because I think it makes people feel like it's something they have to do. And if you want to, like I said, if you find benefit from abstaining from ejaculating for 30 days or 28 days or whatever it is, um, then by all means, like, go ahead. If you want to try something, there's no harm in it. But I think a lot of people, what they do is they feel like it's something that's going to bring them to some higher level and they're going to become this great person because they're able to 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 conquer this goal but they're like literally miserable so they're um they're clenching their pelvic floor all the time because they're stressed about how they're not ejaculating they may ejaculate at night and so they'll have a nocturnal emission and then they'll feel so bad because they've failed it's nothing you can control nocturnal emissions are physiologic they're totally normal and 86 percent of men have had a wet dream at some point in their lifetime like it's very very common and more likely the longer you are from ejaculating so so um, your body will take care of the ejaculate if you ejaculate or not. So you will either resorb the semen or you'll ejaculate at night. And so if you want to do it because you feel like, okay, I have a challenge. I want to conquer it. I want to see if I can do this. And you feel better because you're not, you're able to like not focus on sexual thoughts or you're able to really um, find some other level of spirituality or something by all means go ahead. I don't have a problem with it. What I have a problem with is making people feel bad because they can't do it or they don't want to do it. And with people feeling forced or feeling like they need to do it to prove something to someone else. Yeah. Cause it, I mean, the way that I've had it explained to me is that it's some, something about semen retention gives you some clarity of mind or something. Cause a lot of athletes before they have their, their big fights or, you know, their bigger sort of Olympic competitions, they'll abstain from masturbation. I, I often hear in the UFC, for example, the, um, the mixed martial arts fighting championship that athletes have not had sex or not ejaculated for two weeks before a fight or four weeks before a fight. Yeah. So there's a lot of rhetoric there. I think that comes from, um, historical. So even in Greek, in Greek times, they would tell people to avoid having sex or masturbating prior to, you know, big fights or, or just whatever sport they were playing. And so is it true in data? So if you look at the studies that have looked at people performing athletic feats, whether it's like cycling or running or whatever, um, they have not found that abstaining from ejaculation actually changes their ability to perform. And so in those cases, I say, well, there's no true scientific evidence that we have that it's going to improve. And in fact, if you are someone who, for example, has sex every morning or masturbates every morning, for whatever reason, that's a part of your routine, disrupting the routine can actually be harmful to performance. And sometimes the, the one thing you can say is in terms of disrupting performance is that after you masturbate, you do see an increase in heart rate a little bit. Um, you have a rebound, in, so it decreases, and then you have a rebound increase in heart rate that can slightly affect your ability to recover from performance. But ultimately, I think if you find benefit from it, because people report feeling more aggressive with abstaining, then by all means, if you find it helpful, I think it's fine. But is it mandatory? I don't think so, based on the evidence we have right now. Because I, I heard that rumor many years ago, and I think I assumed it was correct. I, I heard the rumor, and this was the sort of evolutionary story that was attached to the rumor, was that once upon a time when we were out, I don't know, looking for um, a sexual partner, we would need to be more articulate and more persuasive and more, I don't know, attractive, basically. Mm -hmm. So we were at optimal attractiveness before we ejaculated. Then after we've ejaculated, that kind of energy goes out of us and recharges and rebuilds again. So I was, when I heard that, I thought, okay, so if I'm speaking on stage or I'm doing a podcast, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, my mouth and my brain are attached. I'm articulate. I'm persuasive, whatever I need to be. So don't ejaculate or masturbate any time before doing anything where I need to use my brain and my mouth. 
Well, you know, some people describe post not clarity, right? So they actually, <laughs> on the alternative, feel like, and there's no good data on this. The data we have is on people, the very small subset of people who have post nut, post coital, not post nut, post coital dysphoria. So they actually feel bad. But in terms of clarity, um, you know, some people do like when you're trying to, you're motivated to get a partner, right? You're sort of um, trying to uh, woo them. You're really focused on that one singular effort that once you've obtained that, that the like very singular focus goes away. And now other parts of your brain can be activated to then be used for some people will describe being more productive, more able to get work done after uh, masturbation. It's very individualized or ejaculation, whatever it is. Post nut clarity. I've never heard anybody talk about this before. And I've also been told over the years that it's something that just men experience predominantly. And for anyone that doesn't know what post-nut clarity is, the definition that I understand is, and that I have experienced, I'm going to be honest, is that after ejaculation, your desire for the other person reduces quite significantly. And there's a stereotype here that women don't experience this post-nut clarity in the same way. Now, if I asked all of my male friends, if I said to them, has there ever been a time in your life where you were maybe texting someone you were attracted to or, you know, you had some sort of sexual attraction to, and then you masturbated, did your desire um, diminish after you masturbated for that person that you were just texting? I think about 90% of my male friends would say yes. And, yes. And they would describe it as if someone like took some like sunglasses off them, like <laughs> a pretty extreme sudden change. And I've always wondered about this, whether this is just men, if it's just women, why it happens. So when you look at brain studies, right, of people having orgasm and what happens is when you have an orgasm, like your whole brain lights up, right? Because your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, like your pupils. Down. So all these different parts of your body are working. So your whole brain lights up. And then after orgasm, it, it, it gets very like quiet. And so we see that in women, it may take a little longer to get really quiet and men, it happens very quickly. And this may be associated with sort of the hormonal changes that occur after orgasm. So we know that prolactin increases after orgasm, dopamine decreases, and there's sort of some evolutionary theories about why this happens. So one is after you ejaculate, if you are having uh, ejaculation with a woman, then you don't want to have sex again. To, and the same thing with the refractory period, right? That there's some period of time where you're not going to want to have sex again, or you can't have sex even if you want to. And this is because evolutionarily, if you deposited your ejaculate into a woman, if you then had sex again, you could actually dislodge the semen and then you would have less ability to uh, to have fertilized an egg, right? And then the other thought is that you don't want to become overly exhausted, right? So that if you, if you had the unlimited capability to have sex over and over again, that exhaustion could be a real thing. Like, and so you're sort of a protective mechanism. Um, and so those are sort of the theories as to why this is. And there is like an absolute refractory time where like you don't want sex at all. And then there's a relative refractory time where if you had a really novel or strong stimulus for sexual activity that you would be able to. Um, in terms of clarity, in ter because we know there's a little bit of differences in brain, um, it may not be as obvious in women in terms of it takes them a little longer to have that coming down after the orgasm from the brain activity. Um, but probably there is some, we just haven't studied enough. And I, I always say this, that when we look at studies for women's sexual health and men's sexual health, they're so lopsided. So if you type in penis in like a, in like a search engine for Google or for the PubMed, which is where you look up research articles, you're going to find 50,000 articles. If you look up clitoris, you're gonna get 2000 articles. So it's very lopsided in terms of what we study um, for sexual function and in and of itself, sexual function by many people is not seen as mandatory or important for health. And so the funding is less often available for sexual health. That's why we have such little data in some areas.